FPGAs occupy a space between microprocessors and ASICs that is important and keeps gaining prominence. The design space of hardware implementation platforms is rich. On one end, we have full custom ASICs. Full custom ASICs are uh, integrated circuits that we haven't talked about uh, so far. And these are circuits in which you actually uh, draw the layout uh, almost manually. You have to go in and optimize everything uh, to the max. Full custom ASICs are more common with analog circuits, which contain a small number of components, but they can also, uh, it can also be a design approach towards uh, the critical path or highly important path in uh, uh, microprocessors that are produced on a commercial uh, level. Uh, and then we have the standard cell ASICs, which we have talked about uh, in this module. These are um, a little bit less uh, handcrafted than uh, full custom ASICs, but they are still ASICs. So we are drawing the implementation platforms on an x-axis that represents uh, cost and flexibility, and the y-axis that represents performance. Performance here is measured as a power delay product or uh, uh, energy per sample, or something that combines power and speed together in a, in a single metric. And so, Full custom ASICs are definitely going to be the highest performing uh, hardware platform because uh, they are very specific, they are very uh, targeted, they give you exactly what you need. You don't have more hardware than you need, you have exactly the hardware that you need. And they are the most expensive to implement and take uh, the most amount of time, they are the most inflexible, they require uh, highly trained designers. And if there's any change in the design, it's going to take a long time and a lot of money to implement the changes. Standard cell ASICs have slightly less performance than uh, full custom ASICs, just because of the constraint impo imposed upon you that, you that everything has to be uh, derived from the standard cell library. So everything, all the layouts have to come from the standard cell library. And the overall layout of the chip has to be in rows of standard cells connected using metal layers. This is an imposition. This is a constraint that uh, a full custom ASIC does not have to stand by. Uh, and so it stands to reason that, you know, you get a little bit less performance. Maybe not. It depends on the design. But generally speaking, a little bit less performance. On the other hand, uh, the cost is less because the cost of design is less and the flexibility is higher because when you change the design, um, you only have to go through the design flow. You don't have to go and do any manual laying out yourself. At the other extreme of this scale, we have general purpose processors. So we are talking about microprocessors that run on computers or, lab, uh, or um, uh, mobile phones. Um, these are very flexible and uh, they are very cheap uh, because they are mass produced and they're flexible because you can develop a, an app for them and you don't really need a lot of experience it, it's pretty easy to develop for microprocessors and yet their performance is very is very uh, dismal because uh, exactly because of the generality of their nature because of their flexibility they have to support a very large um, very wide breadth of applications. So a microprocessor could be running part of your radio, it could be running part of your application layer, of course it is running most of your application layer, and in the application layer it's going to be running very different apps. It's going to be running compression and decompression, it's going to be running games, and so the architecture has to be very general. You know, it, it, it does everything by fetching, decoding, and executing instructions. So there's a lot of, uh, of overhead because of the generality, and that overhead is imposed upon all applications. And so the performance is much lower than a chip or an ASIC that is application specific. And in the middle between ASICs and microprocessors, we have a space 
that uh, is not empty. We have, um, you know, compromises in the middle. So we have specialized processors. These are microprocessors that are specific for a special embedded task. Uh, they usually don't have an operating system or if they, if they do have an operating system, it is simple and real time. And uh, they don't have all the uh, bells and whistles of a large, you know, Pentium processor or the large like uh, general purpose processor. So uh, they can actually do things um, a lot more efficiently, but it requires a little bit more knowledge of the hardware to be able to program for them. Um, somewhere along the lines, there's also digital signal processors, DSPs, which uh, allow for parallel processing. Um, they usually need you to know some kind of specialized C programming and use some kind of assembly in order to get uh, the most use out of them. And yet they give you a, a better performance. But specifically, I mean, especially interesting and especially important are FPGAs. FPGA stands for Field Programmable Gate Arrays. And this means that they are, not, they are programmable in the field while you're using them. doesn't mean that you program them using an electric field. It means that you can program them in the field rather than in a uh, fab. So their flexibility is higher than ASICs because of that, because they can be programmed and reprogrammed. And yet their performance is actually very good. It's, it, it's close and getting closer to ASICs because FPGAs are actually hardware platforms, not software programming. So the whole idea of FPGAs is that we have an array of cells. And so, you know, it, it looks very similar to a standard cell array because you have an array of cells that are arranged in rows um, uh, and columns. And the only difference is in an FPGA, all the cells are identical. So in a standard cell ASIC, you have rows of cells with the same height but each of the cells is different and has a different width. In an FPGA, all of the cells are identical. And the idea here is that each of these cells is reprogrammable. Actually, a better word is reconfigurable. Each of these cells is reconfigurable so that we can reconfigure the hardware to do something different. And so if you look at this standard cell, uh, this logic cell, so for FPGAs, the uh, cell is called a logic cell. So if you look at the sample logic cell, and of course, you know, caveat, um, full disclosure, this is an extremely simplified logic cell. A typical logic cell in a modern FPGA is going to be a lot more complex than this. So this logic cell contains a flip-flop, a flip-flop, a full adder, a bunch of multiplexes, and a lookup table. Uh, what the multiplexers do is reconfigure the, ce the cell. The DFF, the FA, and the LUT allow us to perform a bunch of functions based on how the multiplexers rearrange them. The lookup table actually allows you to perform any kind of, of, of logic uh, of combinational function that you want. So if you have a four input lookup table, you can use it to build any four input combinational function you want. So this is the address of the lookup table, and this is the content of the lookup table. So if you save the content in this way, you implement the for input AND. If you save it in this way, you implement AB plus CD. In this way, you implement an XOR gate. So you can see that you can actually use the lookup table to build a full adder, right? But you already have a dedicated full adder, which is going to be better performing. And so the idea is that you can reconfigure the cell to do arithmetic by using the full adder. You can reconfigure it to do uh, random combinational logic by using the LUT. Or you can reconfigure it to do sequential logic by using the DFF. Or maybe you can do uh, addition, full addition, and have it registered. So you can use both the FA and the DFF. Or maybe you do full addition and some other pre-processing, combinational pre-processing, and then register it, in which case you use all three components of the standard cell. So the reconfiguration of the standard cell is done by choosing the select lines of the multiplexers. For example, if uh, multiplexer one picks this input, 
then the full adder is going to be fed with the output of the lot. On the other hand, if it makes this input, then this input of the full adder is going to bypass the lookup table. If um, multiplexer 3 can be actually fed the output of the lot, of the full adder, or of the flip-flop, so it can bypass any of them. And so it's obvious that the select lines of the multiplexers are critical because they define how the logic cell is used.